Hello, my name is Aristides Kostelakis and I'm a PhD student at the Leiden University Medical Center. Today's talk is titled A Combined Model for Electrocochleography Simulations in Cochlear Implant Users. First, I would like to start by highlighting the goal of this project, which is improving the interpretation of cochlear implant patient electrocochleography results. We aim to achieve this by creating a model that simulates physiology as accurately as possible. We want then to simulate electrocochleography in cochlear implant users. This simulation stage is at the end of the modeling pathway, which necessitates an accurate simulation of physiology, as mentioned. Lastly, we want to simulate the effect of pathologies in their inner ear. We want to change the parameters of our model and study how they affect the different outputs. For example, we want to see how the endocochlear potential changes the outputs of the inner hair cells. I would like to now make an introduction on how electrocochlography is measured in cochlear implants, its variety of clinical applications and why it is important for us to study it. Electrocochlography or EKG uses an acoustic stimulus to elicit an auditory response from the hair cells. The acoustic stimulus is delivered by inserts such as the one shown in yellow in the figure. The auditory response then takes the form of electrical potentials. The EKG is a measure of hair cell activity so it can tell us what is happening inside the cochlea. Therefore, it is a direct assessment tool of inner ear functionality. EKG recordings in CA patients are done intracochlearly, and the CI is used as a recording electrode. It has a variety of clinical applications, such as the interoperative monitoring of auditory system during surgery. Then we can leverage this capability to reduce insertion trauma in CA patients, thereby preserving residual hearing. The last point is important since Cochlear implant candidates have better and better residual hearing, therefore it is vital for them to preserve it after cochlear implantation because it will help them in perceiving sounds better than if they had lost it. We believe that by recording EKG we can achieve this goal. We are going to be focusing on the cochlear microphonics potential of the total EKG response, since it can assist us during the cochlear implantation surgery. Cochlear microphonics is generated primarily from the outer hair cells. Now I would like to explain how our EKG model functions. First, we present a stimulus to the model. This is usually a pure tone burst of a short duration. This then acts as input to our auditory model. The auditory model then converts this sound to basal membrane velocity, which in turn acts as input to the hair cells. From the hair cell model, we extract extracellular currents associated with inner and outer hair cell activity. The extracellular currents are then used as input to our volume conduction model, which basically shows us how currents spread through the electrode in an implanted cochlea. Then, on each electrode, the responses from all hair cells are combined and the EKG response is calculated. We use the cochlear microphonic potential to calculate the amplitude in each electrode of the cochlear implant, as we'll see later. Now, we'd like to introduce our proposed model, which combines phenomenological and biophysical approaches. The mid layer and the basal membrane are modeled phenomenologically, whereas the hair cells are modeled biophysically using their electrical equivalent. Our previous model was a phenomenological model by Bruce et al. The hair cells in the model output extracellular currents. Then they connect to the electrocochography model where we get the cochlear microphonics response. The biophysical approach to the hair cells allow for the extensive customization of biophysical parameters while linking them to pathologies of the inner ear. This way we can simulate how, for example, damage to the stereocellular tip links affects our ECOG response. Now let's look at some results of the models and compare them with experimental animal data. In this figure, we can see how the basal membrane input-output functions behave for a frequency region of 10,000 Hz, when it is stimulated by two tones. One tone is significantly lower than the CF at 2,000 Hz, and we can see it on the left figure, whereas the other tone is exactly on the CF at 10,000 Hz. The experimental data that is shown in the red line is based on the data measured by Regera et al. in 1997, where they measured chinchilla cochleas using laser velocimetry. In the left figure, where the stimulus frequency is significantly lower compared to the CF, the growth of the input output curves is completely linear. On the other hand, in the right figure, where the stimulus frequency is equal to the CF, the growth is linear until an intensity of 30 dB. Then it becomes compressive until an intensity of 80 dB and it behaves similarly to the animal data, until the intensity of 90 dB where it becomes linear again. The phenomenological model, on the other hand, behaves more linearly across a range of intensities. 
Ruggero et al. have shown that this saturating behavior is common in healthy chinchilla cochleas and that the linearity at very high intensities suggests cochlear damage. Regardless, they have concluded that if the linear behavior returns, it must do so at high stimulus levels. The Basla membrane model of our proposed model accurately reflects this. Now let's move on and look at some results from the outputs of the outer hair cells for both models as well as experimental animal data. The animal data was taken from Dallas et al. 1985 where they used wire electrodes on the cochlea of guinea pigs. It is immediately apparent that the outer hair cell peak receptor potential for the phenomenological model in the middle is order of magnitudes higher than the proposed model on the left and the animal data on the right. It approaches values closer to one volt of higher intensities. The explanation for this is that a phenomenological model was never validated for outer hair cell outputs. However, this poses a problem for modeling cochlemicophonics potentials since we know that they are generated primarily by outer hair cells. Therefore, if we use a phenomenological model, as input storage at the stage, we will get back cochlemicophonic potentials that are too large. Lastly, we can see that in the proposed model, the curves behave similarly to the animal data below the CF, even showing similar peak potentials between them. For frequencies higher than the CF, the slope of the curve is steeper in the phenomenological model and the animal data. Further optimization of the modeling parameters could alleviate this issue. Now let's talk about how we simulate ECOG in our model. First of all, we simulate the temporal cochlear microphonics response, that is the response in time, for every single electrode. For example, in the electrode here in the figure, there are 16 electrodes. This means we get 16 cochlear microphonics responses. Then we calculate the first harmonic amplitude for every single response, and then we combine them to the total response. Now let's look at some ECOG simulations. For these simulations, high-level stimuli were used. On the top row of this figure, we can see the first harmonic amplitude results of the proposed model, whereas on the bottom row, we can see the results of the phenological model that was in use previously. Two different stimuli were used, one at 500 Hz and one at 1000 Hz. The tonotopic mapping of the simulated implant allocates electrode 1 to the 500 Hz region, whereas it allocates electrode 4 to the 1000 Hz region. We can see that both models perform similarly and generate a peak at the correct electrode for each stimulus frequency. However, on the previous model, the cross-turn stimulation effect is more pronounced. If we look closely at the figures, the first harmonic amplitude values of the previous model are in order of magnitude higher. Remember that the cochlear microphonics potential is generated primarily from the outer hail cells. The phenomenological model had very high peak potential values compared to the proposed model for the outer hair cell potential. To conclude, I believe that our model has a satisfactory approximation of physiology, but there is also room for further optimizations. For the future, we want to link parameters to different pathologies and then repeat all previous simulations with altered parameters. That was the end of my presentation. Thank you all for listening.